Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing the head coach for the Australian deaf team. Brent Reed, AKA Stretch, still struggling to call him Stretch, but his nickname is Stretch. He's an amazing guy. He's leading in his own way in many, many different ways. Not only coaching the Australian deaf team and creating a beautiful community, maintaining a beautiful community within that space with the help of others within the, uh, the organization too, but he has created not only his own business in the landscaping uh, world, but he's helped bring a school, an institute, a college over from London here to Melbourne, Australia. Absolutely incredible journey. Um, not only is, it, but that's come at a cost, you know, he has created a safe space today by being vulnerable to other people who might have suffered in the game of professional basketball, in the, in the struggle of um, having difficult conversations, difficult moments, and being able to get through those. Um, we talk about the suicidal thoughts that he enjoyed growing up as a young man. Um, we talk about relationships and the problems that come along with that, but also being dropped and fired from a basketball team, uh, which, you know, led to difficulties and, and having to overcome them. We talk about his childhood. Uh, like many of the guests that I've interviewed brings many, many insightful strategies and mindsets and perspective and, and safe space for me to not only put in my life, but I hope you guys can get something from it too. Anyway, we'll be back after 21 seconds of the intro um, with Stretch, Brent Reed, and uh, I hope you I hope you just sink into the conversation um, because it's awesome to see him so vulnerable and open up. Um, come back for more. We'll, we'll see you soon. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. I'm your host, Andrew White, and this is the podcast that unveils captivating narratives of resilience and personal triumph. This podcast is for anyone seeking inspiration and insights on overcoming life's challenges. Follow and subscribe, and then we can lead together forever. Brent. Good morning, mate. How are you? Good, Andy. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm even better for seeing your lovely face. Oh, you're such a sweetheart, aren't you? Well, you always give me compliments when you see me, so why not give it to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Brent Reed. so uh, thanks for joining me on Leading Our Own Way. Such a, a pleasure. It's been in the pipeline for quite a, a few months now, hasn't it? Yeah, it has been. We've talked about this uh, many a time in the car park of basketball stadiums. So, yeah, it's great great to finally be here and have a bit of a chat and see mm -hmm. where this ends up. I, uh, I'm, I'm glad you've agreed to come on. Um, I, um, we've, uh, we've known each other from the basketball world here in Australia. Um, we didn't know each other in the basketball world before I moved here. Um, but we – and then accidentally, I suppose, came across each other when we both moved to the surf coast part of Victoria. Yeah, I think we were sitting on a scoreboard together talking shit. Yeah, that's right. One, uh, yeah, on a Tuesday night at, yeah. uh, at Torquay. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And uh, we realised um, we used to compete in the same league um, back in the day. Uh, well, I was the assistant coach at one of the clubs, and I think you were still playing at the time. Uh, playing, head coach, I can't remember, yeah. But, yeah, we were around, uh, around the same league a bit for the same time. It's yeah. pretty crazy that you... Um, you know, there's that many people in these competitions. You you sort of don't know each other, and then bump into each other later on down the track. So, um, well, you stand out because you're tall, and I I don't stand out because I'm small. <laughs> well, you probably stand out more than me. Like tall people around basketball is a bit common, but mm. you being as short as what you are. Oh. <laughs> that's one for the crowd. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, no. I, I, hey, look, I'm pretty small, but I'm quick and. Uh, we we have a bit of a three point competition going on in the league. Well, we'll to be fair, it's over thirty fives. Um, not putting the over thirty five league down or anything, but it um, doesn't really count, right? <laughs> <laughs> it counts for me, okay? It's all I've got. Um, but it, it, just for those who are listening and are interested in basketball, Brent's beating me by one three pointer at the moment. I uh, he More than that mate. No one now. It's one. And you've got a game in hand over me, so technically I've got a better percentage. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> that that game you hit too. I went and hit four that game. Just so you know. Um, and no. like zero defense, mate. You were standing half court the whole game. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Anyway, let's get into how you're leading your own way, uh, Brent. W tell everybody why you're here today. Why? What are you doing in the world of Mr. Brent Reed? 
mate, I um, yeah, I, I obviously played basketball. I've um, that, that's been my my biggest passion for my life. I started that when I was five, but um, you know, not everybody's careers in sport turn out the way they want to be or want them to be. So. Um, you know, I found this other love and it was landscaping and horticulture and, you know, being being outside with plants and working in that industry. Um, and then, you know, you sort of, you get these opportunities, whatever your career is. And, you know, I'm a big one of, you know, like looking for, for what's next and, and sort of saying yes and working the rest out later. And um, I found myself over the last, um, five or six years um, moving into the education space of landscape designers. So I've been a landscape designer for about 18, uh, 18 years. Um, and yeah, I've en ended up um, bringing a landscape design college to, to Melbourne um, from the UK. It was started in the UK and, and sort of ending up going from, you know, kind of a, a knockabout kid um, with a couple of weeks um, of work being offered in in landscape as a labourer, to ending up, um, you know, seeing this seeing this opportunity to help um, develop the next generation of landscape designers here in Australia, and and um, you know, and and not just that, but you know, you got to look at the business side. I can't just say I'm, uh, I'm I'm giving everything back. I've got to run a business and I've got to earn a living. Um, turning into a you know from a from a kind of fuck about kid to a to uh, a business person and um, in leading these the next generation of landscape designers. Yeah, that's amazing. So you've you've basically turned a passion of yours that you had a business, and we'll obviously get into that business later on. But you've you've taken it to one step further because I don't think a lot of people who would own a landscape business that's most of them probably that's their journey. That's what they and they're happy doing it. But you've taken it to the next step. I don't even think it would even enter my head to go. All right, well, here's a business. Let's turn it into a a school, a college, let's say, what what made you want to turn it into that? What, why did you want to give back in that way and not just carry on with your own business? I mean, I know you've got the two, um, but yeah, why did you want to turn it into into the sense of creating more landscapers? Well, it, it's been a, um, I, I've been really lucky. You sort of, you know, you touched on um, turning your passion into a career I've, I've been really lucky like the two things that i've absolutely loved in my life is, is like i said basketball and then and then landscaping horticulture hmm. um they are passions they're they're you know they're the two loves two loves of my life that aren't my wife and and my dog hmm. um i've got two dogs but <laughs> you're not meant to have favorites but i do um <laughs> And I'm not. I only have one. Yeah, um, yeah. So you know, they. I, I feel really lucky that the things that I've done in my life, I have been really passionate about, and um, and I have been able to turn them into to you know really good, um, really either a career or amazing hobbies. So, um, you know, that's that's one thing that the um, the bringing the the bringing the college to Australia, I've, I've been um, really fortunate in my career, and both basketball and um, in terms of in terms of landscaping and horticulture, I, um, I I really do feel fortunate in what's been offered to me and what's been put in front of me in those two two paths, and um, I've always felt like. If you appreciate it, you should give back. Like you, you should give something back. Um, the bringing the college to Melbourne started off um, a long time ago. I got told either help fix the problem or shut the fuck up. And um, and uh, there was a couple of things that happened. And and this was a situation where um, there was an there's, there's been an issue with the education of landscape designers in Melbourne. And in Australia, probably, but I'm based in Melbourne. So um, there was um, Burnley College, which was the biggest horticultural college in Australia and, and probably the most prestigious. Um, it was part of Melbourne Uni and Melbourne Uni decided to shut down a lot of the horticulture and landscape design 
um, education um, at Burnley College. So that left a bit of a hole in the industry. At the time, I had uh, a young lady working for me um, who did an internship with my design business um, from from Melbourne Uni. And she'd been with us for a few weeks doing this internship and I actually offered her a job. She was, she was really good. Um, she just fit the team really well. Um, I offered her a job and she was working like two or three days a week, studying two or three days a week. Um, and, and just like, while well, she finished her, her horticultural training and, um, she came in on the, at the first day after, first day back in our office after her first day of second year. And she walked in and said, oh, hey, they're closing Burnley. Hmm. And it was like, what? Like, how can you close like the best horticultural college in Australia? So anyway, that happened um, around the same time, Landscape Victoria put together a panel of um, p- panel of people like landscape business owners, landscape design business owners that were employing people. And it was to look at the education and training of landscape designers. And I went to, I sat on that panel, there was 30 of us that were invited. Um, I sat on that panel and I walked in and, and sort of sat down. And the first question that was asked is who's happy with the education of training of landscape designers in Victoria? And out of 30 people, not one hand went up. Wow. And, um, and the 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 person um, chairing the meeting said, "Okay, I'll ask the the other question. Like, who's not happy with the education of training of landscape designers in Victoria?" And thirty hands went up, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" I, like, I thought it was just me that wasn't that wrapped with it. And I look around, and there's peers, there's people that I looked up to in the industry, there's people that you know that I compete with on a daily ba- basis for work and things like that. Um, and I'm looking around this room and I'm thinking, my God, there is like kind of the who's who of landscape design here in Victoria and no one's happy with this. Like surely this is a case of help fix the problem or shut the fuck up if I've ever seen one. Yeah. Um, and and you, so you realise there's a there's a hole there, there's a gap, yeah. there's a niche there you could go boom. Yeah, there was a, there's obviously a gap and it, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't me. So I'm not going to sit here and say it was an amazing business idea like i'm a i'm a genius look at me i um i actually walked out of that meeting and i got in my car and a really good friend of mine owned was one of the owners of london college of garden design in the uk and i actually wrote him an email before i you know started my car to drive away I wrote him an email and it was a really simple email and it said, if you've ever thought about taking London College of Garden Design International, the time's now and the place is Melbourne. And um, and I, I sent a couple of other text messages. Um, I made a phone call and before I left the uh, left the car park, my phone rang and it was, it was, um, it was Andrew from the UK my and he's, he's like, you have no idea. We have literally just done a feasibility study to take the college. We were approached by an Italian university to take our college to Italy. And we looked into it. We did, did the feasibility study. And the hardest thing that was going to happen was translating the whole course program from English to Italian. Mm. He said, so what we've decided is we are happy to go international, but it'll be the U.S., Australia or New Zealand, um, like North America was was his statement. Uh, North America, Australia or New Zealand, and um, and I said to him, "Well, there's no point in New Zealand. No offence, but like the population's too small for um, for for what we're trying to do." And he went, "Oh, I did, you know didn't think of that." Mm-hmm. So it started a conversation at the time. Um, I. I knew that the college was not the entire solution. Don't get me wrong; like it's it's not a it's not a wonder fix. It doesn't fix all the problems. But for for people wanting to jump seriously into landscape design, we're we're a pretty good solution for that. Um, but 
I didn't know how I'd be involved or even if I'd be involved. It was more for me, it was like, you know, the whole help fix a problem, you know, yeah. like, okay, I'm, I'm healthy. How it goes from here. And I kind of, kind of presumed that I'd, I'd help open the doors, do the introductions. And then the, the college would, you know, the, the UK directors would go from there and I'd get a pat on the back and a thank you. And then the longer it went on, the more I thought, you know what, I I think I want to be involved in this. Like Absolutely. I think, I think this is my chance to, again, give a bit back, create something. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say it's all about giving back. This is also potentially my future and my retirement plan. So, yeah. um, you know, it's a it's a new new chance to build a business, a different business. Um, Obviously, coming off 18 years of running your own business, you learn a lot, you make a lot of mistakes. Maybe this is a chance to start a business with a lot of learnings in the background to, to maybe do it better the second time. And, um, you know, we're iron, iron out some of the bumps in the road. So, yeah, I love that story. It's incredible. It's, it's um, that car was the that, that moment in the car, though, is the pivotal part because most people will come from that meeting and still leave it in the hands of the people who can in the meeting or to the other as you say more experienced or or the ones who are the who's or who's of the industry but you didn't you you that's how you you started to lead your own way because you embedded that thought process and went boom i'm doing something about it with somebody who can do something about it if you know what i mean that's awesome i didn't know that so, yeah it's, sorry it's, no, it's, no, a, it's a funny funny thing um you, you know you, you... <laughs> you see these crossroads like I'm always I've always been about you know what's next what's next and it's like I say say yes and then work out the details later or work out how you're going to do it later yeah it, it's one of those things I'm I'm a uh, probably feel sorry for my wife because there's a billion ideas yeah. you know there's all there's ideas always kicking around hey how about this what about if we try this what about if we do this like and the majority of them are pretty crap ideas um or, but that's or how you find the work. one isn't it by going through the crap ideas that's definitely one thing i've learned by creating this podcast is go through a million crap ideas or you think's crap and some actually they might be crap to you but everyone else thinks it's awesome so yeah maybe it just works do you know what i mean yeah yeah so <laughs> it, it, it's just you know it's that crazy one i'll look back on it now and i'm like i could have got in the car and driven away like you said someone else's problem but yeah, you know, years. Uh, the, mate, I, I've had that um, help fix a problem or shut the fuck up in, in my head for a long time, probably ten or twelve years. And and it came from it came from a friend, a mentor, my first boss, like in the landscape industry. Um, his name's Martin Semkin. He owns you know one of the biggest landscaping businesses in Victoria. Like. He, he he's almost been like a, a father, mentor, um, you know, friend, everything, boss, um, support, uh, like kind of kind of everything to me mm. over the years. And he said it. I was pissing and moaning about something. He must have had a just had enough. And he's like, you know what? Like, this is it. You know, either either fix the problem or shut the fuck up. I'm sick of hearing it. I love it. And, and it just. It just keeps going around in my head, like it, it always has. And this was one of those moments, like, oh, you know, I'm not saying I'm fixing the entire problem. There's a lot of issues, like across the board, but I'm at least providing a solution for people that, that you know, give them an opportunity to 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 follow their passion and you know something that's been such a such a amazing career and amazing life for me. Mm. Maybe maybe it's someone else's path as well. Who knows? Oh, it's brilliant. And I think, every, well, you're creating the path for other people to, to pursue their paths. So if I was coming to you to be part of the London College of Garden Design, um, what would that what would that look like? Um, what would the course look like for, for those who might be interested? Um, yeah, so it's a two-year course. We um, Two days a week. Um, we run two 13-week semesters a year. Um, we're a bit different from standard sort of TAFE courses, university courses here in Melbourne. We run a, a layered based learning program. So mm -hmm. we don't do modules like they do in TAFEs and universities and you have to, 
complete a certain amount of modules to tick enough boxes to get the pass. We actually, you know, basically teach you how to design gardens and the processes from start to finish. Um, everything gets built on. And then, you know, next project, you go right back to the start and we add stuff on at the end. So it's a, it's a building, building layered system. Um, so that's one way it's different. The other way it's, it's very different is, um, is our lecturers. We actually have industry professionals that come in and lecture. So most of our lecturers, you know, are working either landscape designers, construction, landscape construction, um, horticultural professionals, um, you know, we've got soil science experts, all sorts of things. They obviously work their day jobs and then they they will take a day off their day job and they'll come in and they'll lecture for us and then the next day they go back to, you know, That's being industry professionals and experts. So you're learning from people that are literally doing that doing what they're doing every day. Um and and continuing to grow, continue to evolve. So you, you're learning from people that are that are dealing with the right now of landscape design, dealing with councils, dealing with contractors, dealing with clients. Like you know, they 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 they're very hands on. Um, there's some amazing TAFE teachers out there, and some amazing um, university teachers. Don't get me wrong, but. Some of them have been now being university lecturers or TAFE lecturers for twenty years, and they haven't necessarily done that many gardens in that that period yeah. of time because they they are, you know, full time lecturing. So, you know, you're learning. That's the biggest thing. You're learning from people who are who are doing this stuff every day. Would you say that's an impact with those who don't do this as a daily basis? Has the industry changed that much? that they don't have the same feel and touch. Cause that's how I feel of maybe, you know, about certain industries. I'm in the education system. We have yep. decision makers that have not been or never been in the classroom or not been in the classroom for 10 years. And it changes so much. Yep. Is that the same for your, for your part of the uh, industry as well? A hundred percent, mate. Like even just the changes that have been made in dealing with councils and permits and applications and things like that in the last two years, let alone 10 years, yeah. like is, is chalk and cheese, you know, um, something that everybody will, will know about. They'll have, you know, dealings with it, like swimming pool fencing regulations and things like that. Like over the last 10 years, they've almost changed or been amended on about an 18 month um, cycle. So just trying to keep up with that. If you haven't been in the industry active for 10 years, like it's actually really hard just to keep up with building regulations and standard regulations yeah. and things like that. So, yeah, for sure. Um, let, let alone things like, you know, 3D imaging and technology and, you know, what's what's available, those sorts of things like, um, you know, computer programs, software, all that sort of stuff just changes so rapidly. So You don't think of that side of things, do you, usually? No, no, there's so much to it. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people have this really crazy misunderstanding about what a landscape designer actually does. So we every year we run a we run a one day workshop uh, and it's it's kind of an introduction to the landscape design program. And um, we used to call it. So you want to be a garden designer? And it's like a little bit too wordy, <laughs> so I shortened it to introduction to garden design. Uh, and the first question we ask on that day is, um, is what do you think a landscape designer does? And and it's literally just like throw words at us of what you think a landscape designer does. And some of the things that get thrown in there, um, and some of the things that are really obvious get that get left out. Uh, do you mean an example? Mind blowing. Um, like you might, um, people forget that you've got to actually do the drawings. Mm. Like, you know, and it'll be like, oh, you know, planting plants. Like, mate, I haven't planted a plant in 10 years. Well, you know what? This is a good time, actually. Let's bring um, Brett kindly uh, sent me some photos for those who are watching <laughs> on YouTube and, and Spotify. Um, but these, I mean, is this to do, this is part of the college or is this part of your other business that we'll briefly get into as well? Because I know on that note about the uh, lecturers coming in and spending a day out of their work, you do something quite similar as well, don't you? Because you have another business called Candio, is that right? 
yeah, Candio Design is my design business. Um, is so this of which part this is, is this? This is this is Candio. So a lot of this is just our garden designs that that they're we've beautiful, sort of... mate. I'm I'm gonna have to get you into mine. I think <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was a garden for Northern Territory Tourism at the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show. Wow. So that garden was there for five days. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Um, These that's are beautiful, a, mate. That's a little cottage garden. That was, uh, we did that on a, that was a Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show um, garden as well. Mm -hmm. And it was done for a friend that's based down here at Ocean Grove. And he actually does those bronze Labradors as well. Um, his name's Willie Wildlife Sculptures. He's based at Ocean Grove, and he's a he's a bronze uh, bronze sculptor. Oh wow! Um, so yeah, you get like we get to do some really cool things, like you know, to do a garden that's based around Willie's wildlife sculptures are just phenomenal. Like it's super fun, and um, yeah. you know, like just just like I said, man, I've I've been. I've been offered some crazy opportunities in my life um, as a landscape designer, as a basketball player. Like you just, you know, it's it's great to know what's next, but you've also got to appreciate, you know, what what opportunities you get. You got to be able to look back and reflect on on what you've been able to do, and um, you know, if you're only worried about what's next and what's ahead, you kind of forget about the other stuff. And yeah. Um, you know, seeing those seeing those photos is, you know, when you said, can you send some photos through, it's just an opportunity to go and look back and just find some cool stuff that that I thought was yeah. fun and enjoyable and means something to me for all all sorts of different reasons. But yeah, yeah. it's phenomenal, mate. Um, yeah, absolutely love it, and that's why I wanted to share them as well. Um, with 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 the um, one of my other guests said. You know, I've, I did this as a guest gem, which I'm going to use yours as a guest gem, you know, the shut the fuck up uh, quote. Um, but he mentioned, well, you either do it, it'll either work or it won't work. Yeah. And it when you break it down to be that simple, it makes perfect sense just to give it a go, right? And I know there's a, there's a lot of hardness in between those little sticky moments of, of going for it. But I think if you don't step into it and it makes it feel comfortable, that little small step, it the next step is easier. Whereas before you step into that messy moment, that's two steps away. It seems really hard, but when you make that first step, it, it's not so bad, is it? And I've realized yeah. that by doing this podcast, you know, I've made it really hard for myself because I think of these brand new ideas and all of a sudden and I'm, I'm, I'm adding an extra 30 minutes to my time, but then per day, but then when I get good at it, it gets squashed down, which ultimately yeah. makes it better, I suppose. That's what I'm trying to, I'm translating to my experience with doing the podcast. Is there any other moments for you where you've done that crossroad or that messy moment or that pivotal, like the car sitting in the car decision making? Is there anything else that you've done in your life that would cross over? And yeah, there, there, there was a, there was a massive one actually, like, um, and obviously it, you know, this might jump back and forward a bit. So yeah, um, that's fine. I don't know about the structure of your... No, 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 it's free to go. But there was a huge one. Uh, I, I worked for a boss. Um, I worked for a boss previously. And it, it just, it, it ended up being, it started off being an amazing situation. And it ended up being a bit, a little bit toxic and a little bit, you know, like just not the right place. Um and and I'm always I'm one that you, you got to learn the lessons out of out of things and like even you know I think back and I think the last year was really really toxic and a bad environment to be in, but there were some really valuable lessons that I learned from it, mm. and one of those lessons was I never want to work for somebody ever again, <laughs> like and it was if someone's going to make decisions that are going to affect me. I want to be that person to make those decisions. Like if instead of being a step removed and someone's making a business decision that takes money out of my pocket or affects the business or, you know, like all of a sudden you're not in control, right? So so that was a big thing. Like if I'm going to – if there's decisions to be made, I want to be the guy making the decisions for myself, all right? And if I fuck them up, I fuck them up. And I'll wear that. I'll, I'll wear that, all right? But 
when they win, I win. <laughs> and and that was a huge thing. So I made that decision. I started my own business and I, I went out on my own. And, um, and that was good. I was like 28. I, you know, 10 foot tall and bulletproof and indestructible. Um, and I worked for six months and I got the opportunity to go and work overseas. Now, after being a big hero and saying I'm never going to work for anybody else, I took the opportunity. I went and worked for someone. This guy, same thing, mate. Bad businessman, bad business decisions. I'm in a different country. Um, I'm being affected weekly on a guy making bad business decisions, and his business decisions would then affect me getting paid that week or that mm. month. And it reassured me, like, no, fuck it. Bet on yourself, man. Like, just, just back yourself in. Mate, you can lose money, but at least you are in control and you make the decisions about about your life and your business and how you want to do things and how you want to conduct yourself and how you want to be seen. Mm. Um, you know, I, 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 in that case, I'd turn up and I'd be getting abused by clients because of decisions that the boss had made and I'm like, mate, this shit's got to stop. Like, if I'm going to get abused by someone, it's going to be something that I've done or said or a decision I've made, not some other clown's ass. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.